Hello, everyone. I got this new video out. This one is a little unusual uh, than my normal thing that I tend to make. Uh, what I tried doing on this one is I got a bunch of my artist friends together, and we decided, hey, uh, let's let's try making a video like together, like one thing. So I, I'm going to be doing the audio and kind of storyboarding it and doing a bit of the art, and they're going to be making some art. And so we're going to put it all together into a video, and we'll just we'll we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. See see if it. Uh, Turns out well, so it's a little bit of an experiment, so might might be something cool, maybe not, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, thank you. Anyway, that's it. On to the video. Enjoy! A lot of times when people are writing to me, they're asking me how to run the game. Either it's their first time, or they're having a problem, and they want to know how to fix it. I don't know why they're writing to me, but I get it, because learning how to run Dungeons & Dragons from the rule book can be like learning how to write from the dictionary. It's a reference manual, mostly, and the DMG really tries to give some help, but, ah, you know, practice... Practice makes perfect. Well, maybe not perfect, but it can help. If I was going to point anywhere, I'd probably point towards modules, which um, they help you understand encounter design and story structure. That being said, in my own homebrew games, I don't use a lot of modules. Even though I got a bunch of them, most of the times when I buy them, they just kind of go onto the shelf, and I'm like, yeah, can't wait to read this when, when I get a chance that, that's going to be coming up. You and me. We're gonna be a team, going off on, on an adventure. And it stays on that shelf and I completely, totally forget about it. Usually when I'm looking at modules, I'm going for inspiration. So, you know, something that it gives me, um, like an interesting plot line or, or some kind of unique map. I think my favorite book when I run is the Monster Manual. There's just so much lore and stuff in there to get the imagination going. You can take any monster and it has this big, thick, background of like where its goals are and lore and you, you know you can just take even just small chunks of that and there could be entire narrative spun around those details. I also like to think about what monsters and races would work well together like how the cults of Tiamat is often made of these priests and knights but also kobolds and drakes and there's might be a head dragon running it. Every DM has their own style when it comes to miniatures and accessories. Personally I don't use figurines other than the the paper ones because the figurines tend to be a little bit pricey, and then you have to paint them, and it's it's too it's so tough to find the correct ones when you need it. Even if I have the Dwarf Fighter minis, I won't remember, I'll just forget, and I'll just use something else as a substitute, and then the next day I'll be like, oh, wait, are those the Dwarf Fighter minis? Like, I probably should have pulled those out. When I run encounters, I just use a wood pog with a number on it so that the players can see it across the table and be like, I'm shooting at number four. Instead of, that one on the left, no, the other, nope, my left, yeah, that, no, okay, yes, that one. I like to use a mat because it tends to be easier on the players. There's a limited amount of information in the scene that people can remember at one time. And without the mat, people keep forgetting where they are, or I forget, and they have to remind me. Although I ran Call of Cthulhu for years without one, and that, that was fine, seemed fine. Although, positioning in D&D is a lot more important than it is in Call of Cthulhu, because you have to see who's where for the abilities and magics, uh, but anyway, it's up to you. You can work either way. I remember we used to have a bunch of these set dungeon tiles that we'd use with printed images on them. They're very detailed and really, really nice and very cool. I like them. But it led to the rooms to feel kind of samey because you keep running out of them and having to reuse the same one over and over. And it also led to some very interesting situations. What's with this town and their cults? This is like the fifth ancient pentagram of evil we've been through. They really need to get their reins on it. <sighs> I needed a big room. We only got three. One was a snake pit. The other one was used. So I just I just had to use this one. Personally, I don't use a DM screen. Not anything against them. It's just that since I don't have a set of figurines to hide, it's usually not a problem. But I do keep having to hide my notes under a book or something. Just the other way, they just don't accidentally see the map. Also, I often end up moving other people's pieces because they're back at the other end of the table. So it helps to not have something between me and the board. I find that if I use a DM screen, I have to stand up to look over it because it, it's a sight block. It prevents you from looking at, at sheets or looking at the characters or looking at stuff on the board. In my videos, I will often draw myself with a DM screen, but that's just for convenience sake. That's just so that you can say like, oh, it's Ben, he's, he's GMing. The way that I track initiative, I just draw the table and write the numbers that people roll down and just look to that player when it's their turn. There's different players when it comes to dice. There's some players who buy a set or two and then call it a day. Then there's the, uh, the dragons sleeping on a massive pile of dice at night. I'm a dragon. These aren't for me. These are for my players, really. I swear. Can I borrow some? No, get away. They're mine. 
I keep having to make up excuses for why I need more dice, because obviously I can't use all the dice that I have, but yet I need, I have, I have to buy more, so I have to keep making up reasons to have them. Before it was, I'm a DM. What if I need to roll like 37 D6s? Really? Or what if I ran a game for, you know, 15 players and they all needed several sets? and then accidentally broke them, and then I have to buy replacements, so that way they, they'd have them, that'd... I need like 45 sets of dice, wouldn't I? I like to keep my dice at my workstation next to me, so that I can roll when I'm bored. When I went to Comic-Con, my favorite booth for me was Chessex, which was like, was littered with dice everywhere. I went back there several times to pick up sets. Every dice needs a home! From them I got these, which I really like. They are D4s. Eight-sided D4s. I like them because they tend to roll a bit better and are easier to pick up than the pyramid dice. And then I have these two. I like to roll these so that way the players can see the numbers across the table. And this, I have a black die from the Captain Morgan Black Spice Rum that I often use to represent like the big bad or, or one boss. One time when I dumped out a bunch of my dice onto the table, I actually had one of my players who was very impulsive who just immediately spent time sorting all of them. Just why? Why? Just... Just because they're there, and then they got upset when they noticed that one of them was missing. You did this to yourself. This is all on you. When I ran for Adventures League, I had a table of very young players in high school who had just gotten into D&D. I overheard that they didn't have books, so I secretly went out to buy seven copies of the player's handbook. And the next time we met up, I brought them in. I thought it was going to be like... Wow, you're giving this to us? Oh yeah, these old things? I need to get them out of my house, because they've been around for forever. You're giving each of us a player's handbook? Wow, you're a super awesome person, and also really cute. The lengths that I go to to try and impress my younger players is truly staggering. Turns out that didn't happen. Apparently, they all had player's handbooks and I misheard. What they were missing was the Monster's Manual, so I pretended like I had an extra copy with me and gave it to them, and then immediately bought another. But yeah, that's, uh, that's why I have several copies of the PHP that I've been trying to give away. When I first started, we had a Chessex mat which we would use in a lot of our games, which didn't last very long until the mat got destroyed. Usually when we'd play, the DM would be prepping the next part of the adventure. He'd hand one of us players a mat and a print out of the dungeon and say, copy this map onto that mat. It was my turn to copy it, so I went off to the corner to write it down, but I didn't know which pen to use, so I decided to be responsible and test the marker out. I took the dry erase pen and made a little doodle on it, then wiped it with my hand. It came off clean, so I thought, okay, Chessex Matt's okay with dry erase. And I drew the dungeon with a dry erase pen. Besides, it's, it's dry erase, you don't need anything to erase it, it's erases dry, you know, it's it's easier to, you know, you get it. We played out the game, and it was a great session. Then the DM tried to erase the dungeon, and it wouldn't come off. What we discovered is that if you put a dry erase markers onto a Chessex mat, it is erasable for a short time, but the dry erase markers will slowly bond to it over time and become permanent. But I wasn't gonna let that stop me, no sir. I took it home trying different chemicals on it to see what would work. Hand soap. No. Ammonia? No. WD-40? No. Vinegar? No. Bleach? That's really tough. No. I was slowly working my way up to more and more corrosive materials, until I was just, I was just gonna have to accept that I'd tried every single chemical in the house. I came into the living room, I was like, okay, I'm done, I tried everything, done, it is not coming off. Well, you haven't tried quite everything, my dad said. You haven't tried this stuff yet. And he goes over to his drawer and he hands me this old metal spray can, which it was so old and rusted that the label was unreadable. We use these on cars. It'll get the job done. I took the can, didn't know what it was, sprayed it on a section of map, and wiped. It worked! Too well! Boring a hole through the top tan level of the map and down to the lower white sheet underneath. But what I saw was that the black mark was in the lower white sheet. The pen had soaked through the tan layer on top and onto the white layer below, and at that point, I knew it was a lost cause. I bought my DM a new mat and brought it to the next game session. Since then, I've remembered what pens to use and have not made the same mistake twice. 